Books You Slept Through, the book podcast where we read and discuss classic books. I'm your host, Kyle Davis, along with a girl who needs no defense of the sanctity of her... I don't know where I'm going with that. My sister, <laughs> Meredith. <laughs> How's it like, going tonight, really, Mare? We really going there? No, I do I have two know. children. Well, this is true. <laughs> and I used to hold you in such high regard, too. Oh, my goodness. Aww. How are you tonight, Mare? I don't know if that's true. I'm yeah. good. <laughs> good. It's been, at- uh, it's been a it's been a minute since we potted, so we're going to discuss these latest chapters uh, in uh, in old Wheeland. <laughs> no Wheeland. Oh Wheeland. Oh Claire. <laughs> All right. Oh Claire. Oh Claire. <laughs> oh Wheeland. Oh, All right, man. All right. So just uh, very quickly to catch everyone up uh, to where we are in Wheeland, um, Clara and Theodore Wheeland, brother and sister. Theodore marries. Catherine Playel, uh, Clara apparently has the hots for Brother Playel. What's his, does he have a first name? I don't even know. Playel. Theod- Wait, no, her brother's yeah, Theodore. Her brother's Theodore, right? yeah. Anyway, so Clara and, um, <laughs> Theodore's, doesn't matter what his name is, he's just called Playel through the book. Uh, Clara and Theodore's father exploded one night, uh, he was very religious-ish man. Spiritualish. Spiritualish, yeah, more spiritualish. Exploded one night. Clara and Theodore then uh, start hearing voices, warning them of various things throughout their lives. Uh, so they have a little friend group. They kind of hang out. Uh, this guy named Carwin shows up. Uh, Clara becomes sort of obsessed with him. Um, turns out Playel knows him because they, they hung out for a couple of months in Spain. And so they invite him into the group. He sort of joins the group, is sort of strange and mysterious, never mentions, like, where he was from, what he's been doing. He kind of keeps, you know, his bio details to himself. (laughs) Well, Clara then uh, hears some voices when she's sleeping in her closet. Well, she's not sleeping in her closet. While she is sleeping, (laughs) she hears voices in her closet. No, she's not sleeping. She's She's, going to write. And she's going to read some books. Correct. And she's thought. Maybe I should go to sleep. Nah, I'm going to stay up and do some stuff. Right. Well, she hears voices in the closet that one guy wants, two men's voices. One wants to shoot her, one wants to strangle her. Uh, Turns out that she hears the voices again later, at least one of them. Turns out it's Carwin's voice. Carwin is hiding in her closet and he pops out one evening. Uh, They have a little (laughs) discussion. (laughs) About he wanted to kill her, and now he doesn't want to kill her because something is protecting her. But she warn he warns her of the other voice, because I guess the other voice still wants to kill her. Kind of unclear at this point what the heck is going on. Well, I got confused just for a moment there about which time there were voices in her closet. Well, it was twice, two times, yeah, multiple. Right, this is true. So the second time is when she's sitting up to write. Yes, the second time when Carwin pops out. Right. Yeah. Right. Because she goes, she she goes to the closet. She opens it, I think, and Carwin's in there. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. And she rightfully assumes her scoundrel of a brother is hiding in there. It's been known to happen. It's. I don't know who would do that. That seems completely um, unbelievable <sighs> and and unrealistic. I mean, now that they're adults, yes, it does seem Pro- probably completely unrealistic. <laughs> well, I don't know. I wouldn't. I wouldn't put it past me. Uh, so then we get into, I bring this up to speed in chapter 10. So chapter 10 opens and uh, Carwin has just appeared out of the closet. And they've had this little discussion. Well, now Clara injects a little bit of doubt into our story because she's like, well, was that Carwin's voice that I heard that wanted to strangle me? I'm not 100% sure anymore. Um, Carwin leaves, right? He did. He. Mm -hmm. Departs the scene after telling her, I wanted to kill you, but now I don't. Which is, okay, kind of unsettling in and of itself. So then she hears footsteps in the hallway. She's like, oh no, Carwin's back. He's, now he's, he's coming to kill me again. Uh, she grabs a knife. And in good Victorian, is this Victorian? Is this, I don't even know what era we're in. (laughs) Old, right? Old 1700s. In old, in old timey fashion. She says, right. uh, I, I never thought of using it for defense. I was going to kill myself to save my virginity from this would-be assailant. Like, oh, right. okay, Clara, great. With uh, a tiny pen knife. Yes. She was just gonna, I don't know, slash herself, slash her neck. Right. Well, as, says, as, you know, spoiler alert, as we'll find out, maybe uh, being thought of as a fornicator is worse than death 
back then. So, you know, apparently she apparently had she the decides right idea. maybe I'll just hurl myself from the window. Right. Which I think she's on the second floor, so she <laughs> might sprain an ankle, um, <laughs> might dislocate her shoulder. I'm, I'm not sure if that's really going to kill her. But anyway, the sounds recede, and she hears Playel's uh, door room slam. And I think, unless you are a five-year-old watching Scooby-Doo, you can probably figure out that it was just Playel coming to check on her. Why didn't she think of that? I don't, because she's never seen Scooby-Doo, so she... What? Anyway. <laughs> but she looks out the window, and then she sees Carwin that's out by the why. bank of the river. And she's like, oh, that's Carwin out in the distance. <laughs> and that's chapter 10 you, okay uh, yeah there's more to unpack in chapter 10 because <laughs> <laughs> i was starting with a fact she didn't think it was playel going into playel's room yeah because she was like weirdly obsessed with the fact that okay so he doesn't show up when he's expected and i get it there's no mode of right. communication then. there's no letter there's no text and so if you're gone you might be dead, but she's also was like imagining his body like bloated and washed up, like having <laughs> <laughs> having died some terrible death. Anyway, I guess maybe she was so obsessed with that that she didn't realize that it could be him. That's coming true. home. That's true. If she thought something untoward had happened to him, and that's why he didn't show up to their play rehearsal right. that they were doing. Right. <laughs> So that wasn't her first thought. But the other thing about this was, honestly, as an adult, why does she think her brother's in the closet? Why Why does she think they don't live in the same house? He would have had to trek across the grounds. And we've established the, the only entry into her room is her door. Like, there's no secret right. closet staircase. I mean, you have some insight into... <laughs> brotherly closet hiding what, what time do you think would be a reasonable hour at which a brother would enter a closet <laughs> to be dude was probably jerk. there all day if he was doing it right <laughs> and see and that's why carwin thinks she must have known he was there because there's no other reason why she would have been so bold or brave is to try to rip open the door which she can't open but she was bold and brave because she thought it was her brother and clearly her brother would never hurt her so that's why she decides to try to open the door which convinces carwin that some other entity it is is at work warning her and allowing her to um find him out and so then he decides well i'm not going to kill you because you have help my dog is being very rude <laughs> i was wondering if that's what that was i couldn't quite tell <laughs> she must not be used to me talking right now probably not so that's why we need to pod more regularly yeah definitely yeah it, it was um you know the the main thing that i it really is foreshadowing that you know she grabs the knife with no thought of self-defense and she's going to just finish herself off lest she be ravaged by some, you know, savage man entering her room. Well, it is her self-defense. She's defending her purity and her honor. This is true. <clears throat> As we're going to which, see, it, that's, you know, a big deal. Um, it, yeah. I mean, yes. Anyway. Yeah. Let's keep going. <laughs> it, it, and it is Women's History Month, so it's appropriate that we're, we're discussing this in, uh, in March, right? I guess so. <laughs> So then we get to this is this is women's history, right? It's women's fictional history. I mean, <laughs> whatever the ideas of, of social pure mores of the seventeen hundreds. Yeah, yeah, we're about to find out what Playel thinks like a, a woman should be, like the ideal right. type of woman. Right. So we get to chapter eleven, and surprise, surprise, the footsteps she heard going to Playel's room was in fact Playel. <laughs> So he, da, da, da. I know, right? So so he's very upset and, and he wants to talk. And he accuses her. He's like, you are no longer a virgin. And he believes it is Carwin who has taken her virginity. And he names him as a murderer and a thief. And he's so incensed. He's like, he's got to get out of this house. Because he's been, he's been staying in Clara's house, which I guess that I'm doesn't surprised seem... By. Yeah, which that doesn't... You would think that if he has these notions of impropriety just from uh, circumstantial evidence that the fact that he's living across the hall from her that that right? wouldn't give 
the same idea to other people that didn't occur. I guess to him. because Judith lives there also. The ser- the the living yeah maid perhaps yeah servant. So it's okay. Yeah. What, yeah. what bothers me about this is I I identify with Clara wanting to defend herself from being ravaged and like assaulted. I get that. Like I'm protecting myself. Pliel isn't thinking that. He's not thinking, oh my God, you must have been hurt or assaulted or taken advantage of something terrible. He thinks that he's so angry because he thinks it was wi- like a willing act right. that she's done. And at no point is he worried about her. He thinks, well, you wanted to do this. I mean, and we're going to find out why. Well, yes, but we're that... going to find out why, which we, we sort of alluded to in, in our last episode. But yeah, we'll get to that. Yeah, but we, I, we I totally get her like wanting to be safe from Carwin coming to act like literally sure. ravage her. Right. That makes sense. Which Playa's Carwin admitted in not. the last at chapter that he right. was going he was going to. So that her was his fears. Plan. Right. It's not her fears were definitely you know very grounded and yes, you know. Uh so then he he goes off to Wheelands. He's so upset he leaves and he goes off to Wheelands. And so Clara goes after him. And she runs into uh, Playel's sister Catherine, who's Whelan's wife. And is she is she pregnant? Because she mentioned she's very delicate health. So I I couldn't remember I if she was pregnant so. at this point. I she think she's be. pregnant. Wait, do they have other kids? They, they've had kids, yeah. and maybe she's in ill health. But you know, basically, Clara says, you know, because Catherine is of of, of a delicate nature, I'm not going to upset her with what's just happened. Um, but so she, she talks with Catherine and she's trying to root out like what's going on. Um, and she finds out that Playel has spent the entire morning, I guess, you know, some, I guess Clara must've stayed the night at her place after Playel left. Um, she finds out that Playel has spent the morning talking and walking with Wheeland. And so now she's worried. Okay. Playel has obviously convinced my brother that, that mm-hmm. I've done this. And she's, she's very worried. Um, so she's very desperate to talk to, to Theodore and he says, look, you've, you've got to believe me. I don't know what, what Playel has told you, um, you know, but please, you know me, I'm your sister. I would never do these things. And, um, to his credit, he says he believes her. He says, yes, I, I know, I know Wheland has said all these things or not Wheland, uh, Playel has said all these things to me and if his arguments were very sound, but you are my sister and I believe you and I know your character, um, what but a he nice tells her, brother. He is. What a nice guy. What a nice brother. I wish I had a brother who felt that way. Who, who thought nice things about you? <laughs> yeah. Who didn't, like, happen to see me at a party one night and then decide, well, there's no hope for her. <laughs> I didn't. That wasn't me. <laughs> that was I never, you. I never put it. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> yes, it was you. It was not me. <laughs> well, it must have been Susan's previous husband. <laughs> 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 no that oh you're are you no 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 i didn't think anything well maybe i did you, yeah yeah <laughs> you were still hanging out with high school classmates of mine and i well said, that anyway that says more about their character <laughs> than mine than i would like to point <laughs> out right. there is a pronounced difference in age between the two of us so very pronounced know, for most most listeners are probably like why is you know, hanging out with people from high school that's fine well nah. they were middle-aged by that time I was in college, not. though. You were in college? Yeah. Were you? I was like 20. Oh. No. I think. Yeah, you'd be a little older, honestly, because I didn't get You didn't meet until Susan until... Susan was there. You didn't were meet we married her until yet or no? I was in college. I don't know if we were married yet. Oh, anyway. that I don't know. I don't remember. Yeah. Uh, anyway. <laughs> irregardless. Uh, <laughs> chapter 12 uh, happens. And so, you know, Theo has just told... Clara that we or Playel's about to leave on a journey, so she rushes over to his place. Um, but Wait, first, you she didn't to... you didn't say why he believes her, not just because it's his sister, but because she's like, look, don't tell me anything about his story. I will tell you mine, which is the truth. And if they are distinctly different, then you know. True. Right. 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 And, he's and he like, does oh. he does say your story is pretty fantastical. But I think because he's also heard the voices, he knows the sort of supernatural in their family. So maybe that's why he's yeah. inclined to believe her. And there's literally been not a single moment up until this very point 
that would lead anyone to believe, and this is her main argument, that that's who she is. They spend right. all their time together. Right. And then yeah, exactly. suddenly exactly. she's like this wanton, like <laughs> Im- immoral seductress or something. She's like, when would I even do this? We hang out at each other's houses until 4 a.m. reading Cicero. Like, come on. <laughs> <laughs> when am I Slut. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Don't read the classics, girls. <laughs> I'll mark you out. Uh, so yeah. So anyway, so so she goes over to Playel's place, but not not without stopping at uh, Mrs. Baton's first. You gotta gotta pay, pay respects to. Mrs. What Baton. is Mrs. Baton? It just she's, sounds like this is a house where you just stop to hang out. Yeah, it's like just a friend of the family. You know. Okay. She sounds like a nice old lady that you just. She's like you the know, cool you're in the neighborhood, and if Mrs. Baton finds out you stop by, or you went past her place without stopping, she'll be upset. I don't. So you could just go there and take a nap, and she'll. That's what she does, yeah. Get her servants to give you a snack. Exactly. I wish I knew Mrs. Baton. Maybe I'll be Mrs. Baton when I'm older. Yeah, that's so what like, you can do. Exactly. Come on over, kids. Be Wait, Mrs. that's Baton. weird these days. You can't do that. <laughs> you, can't, <no. laughs> you can't do that now. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, so anyway, she gets to Playel's, and uh, she's pretty distraught, but Playel is, is pretty stone-faced. He doesn't care, because he thinks she is just a terrible person. And he begins to go off on her and says, you know, at once I held you in such high regard. Ugh. I thought you were the most virtuous of women, you know, the, the kind that poets would write about and artists would hold as the ideal. Of, you know, he's, he's just he's laying it on thick. Um, and then he says, you know, but then I found out this about you. And now I, you know, ugh, I, I detest you and whatnot. Um, you know, this kind of goes back to what we had said last time about the all of a sudden romance we're, we're just supposed to take it as as a, a fait accompli that they are now a romantic item even though he was trying to hook up with that duchess in germany or something right. who died <laughs> like and claire was so pumped when that lady died <laughs> i so i guess she's been holding the you know holding the torch for him since the start of the book i don't know i guess i don't know i mean it's, it's probably the only male other than her brother that she interacts with you know, because she just hangs out at his house. It, it took me a while as I, the, my first read through this. So I've read sections of it multiple times at this point. But my first read through this, and I remember texting you, I thought that Wyland and Clara. Wait, no, I thought Playel and Claire were brother and sister. <laughs> and then and then she was like in love with him. I was like, oh, I am wrong. Oh, I yeah. misread something. <laughs> Much different reading of the book in that in that case. Well, it doesn't help that it's it's Clara and Catherine. You know, her sister yeah, is Catherine. It's true. Yeah. It's true. Well, so anyway, she he he this guy really lays into her, right? Like he reads her the riot act to the point where she passes out. She straight up <laughs> faints. Like he is so rude to her. Uh, Have you so ever she... been so angry at someone that you could pass out? Because it's just so like, the argument is so unbelievably not true, and you know it. But they're professing it. I feel like I've been there. Anyway. I, I don't know if guys pass out when we're angry. I just, you get adrenaline, you want to fight. Like I've gotten in well, fights, I've been so angry, but I've not passed out that I'm so angry. Yeah. There's, like, there's a um, place down the street called, ooh, something Philly. <laughs> Thanks, Mayor. Um, <laughs> what's it called? Uh, oh, oh, damn it. So uh, that's anyway, like, I, so I used to a... live in South Carolina. That's like saying, oh, yeah, you know that place, uh, Palmetto something or other. Yeah, uh-huh, every place is named Palmetto something or other. <laughs> it's uh, it's a, a break stuff place. Basically, you go there, you pay money, and you can bust stuff up. Sure, yeah, a rage room. F- that's what it is. F- yeah. Rage Philly, I think hey, it's Hey, there you go. There you go. We have See, the Fracture Factory down the street. So. Ah, there you go. See, I should go spend some time there, especially after today. <laughs> <laughs> I, just like... I actually, I, you know, unfortunately, Susan's got like, you know, hand stuff, so she can't really do it. But I think it'd be good for her, too. But I looked it up and like you had you can pay like there's a set price um, and you could like go in and like bust up plates and TVs. Yeah. And and then if you get a bunch of friends together, you can um you know, get like five, ten people, and you can bust up a car. Yeah. Like a like a Street Fighter bonus stage, man. 
I had that idea when I was a teenager. Like I thought I came up with it first. Yeah. Um, <laughs> there's a really cool Limp Biscuit song called Break Stuff. Just oh, one of I those love, days. <laughs> it's one of the best. Vid- I love that video so much, by the way. Just, <laughs> it's, that's it one of my like <laughs> guilty pleasure Limp Biscuit music videos. Just, <laughs> I love that video so much. <laughs> it popped up on my Spotify driving back from your house yesterday. And oh. I was like, nope, can't do it. <laughs> no, oh, you can't. Oh, I love that song. I didn't. That, I, I, I unironically love that song. <laughs> Absolutely. Song. Absolutely. It's one of those days. <laughs> anyway. Oh, anyway. I also did listen to your ninja band. Uh, oh, you did? I did. Listen to a little ninja good. sex party. Oh, I did. very good. Oh, good, good, good. Yeah. Uh, Welcome to my parents' house is pretty good. It's, it's a very good song. Yeah, it's an excellent <laughs> oh song. Gosh. I have um, their cover albums, though. That's the, all I've been listening to for the past, good. like, month yeah they have some yeah excellent the, the cover albums are fantastic i was like waiting for the joke i'm like this is too good it's not funny no it's yeah, is this they, real they've is got this a, a bunch of cover albums um no yeah i figured it out once i saw that the it was called up well, have, have you listened to um the cover album with the, the super guitar brothers Mm-mm. oh it's good because it's it's stripped down it's just acoustic guitar um doing mm-hmm. the, doing some covers oh it's so good yeah check it out um <laughs> And good news, so they good announced like an eye roll. Oh. No. <laughs> good news, they announced there's going to be a new album this year. Oh, good uh, news! And a new cover album. And uh, if you're if if you like Ninja Sex Party, you got to check out Star Bomb. That's the other project they do that's video game related. Um, there's going to be a new Star Bomb album this year. Music? Though, yes, music. Like funny music or just video game music? Video game. Well, funny video game music. It's, oh, oh, oh. I'll send you some after the pod. Anyway, we we have gone on a tangent here uh, <laughs> we have to get back to the 1700s. If you, yeah, if, you, if you're wondering, no, that has nothing to do with what's Absolutely happening nothing to do with the story. It's, no, not at all. Um, I feel like none of the characters in this story would like any of that music, sadly. Uh, no. But anyway. No. I feel like they would like a nice dirge. Yeah. Huge. Yeah. A funeral. Car, now, Carwin, he might... I think Carwin would listen to Limp Biscuit. You think Carwin so? might be all right. Yeah, I think Carwin might be all right. Yeah. All right, so... <laughs> uh, so she passes out. So Clara passes out. Um, ends up staying the night at Play L's or however long. And when she wakes up, um, you know, his servants have been attending to her. And Play L's very concerned. Because he's like, oh, man. Yes, he calls her friend. To... Yes, he's like, hang out here. It's cool. It's fine. But then, as chapter 13 opens, um, anything else on 12 before we go to 13? All these sort of um, flow together pretty well. So, Yeah, I mean, the fact that he, the, the biggest thing I think about 12 <clears throat> is that he is so angry at her, he, he, she passes out, and he basically was hoping that she was coming to confess and say she was sorry and ask yes. for forgiveness Good and point. admit yes. that all of it was true all along and he was willing i guess to debase himself as to forgive her yes. and then when she doesn't when she says no it's not true then it infuriates him and well remember he thinks he's got rock solid evidence yeah he thinks he he yeah. has heard it from her own mouth right basically Correct. and and then he just he's like it's not your fault perhaps your education was off <laughs> perhaps <laughs> it, that's what's to blame no and one told you not to hook up with guys before you married <laughs> you didn't get it. you just missed it in all of society <laughs> and culture up to yes. this point yes. um so he's ready to like forgive her and when she sticks to it his countenance changes and he is even more angry and digs in like nah i'm leaving right. then i'm leaving right. and i think he as we will see as 13 opens He's only concerned about her because he thinks maybe he killed her or something. Right. And once he figures out she's all right, suddenly (coughs) he goes from being, you know, conciliatory to being a jerk again. And he goes back to his sort of hard-faced and cold aspect. Well, before he leaves, she's like, I got to talk to you. And she says, all right, look, you're so convinced, at least do me the honor, lay it out. What, mm-hmm. why do you think this? Like, you have to at least explain it to me. Why do you think this? And so then he begins to tell her. And we, we talked about it uh, previously, but one of the first pieces of evidence is he's like, look, you drew this picture of this guy 
And then you were like obsessed with it. <laughs> so what was I supposed to think? I thought you were like in love with this guy. Right? <laughs> So, and so he tells her that once I saw how, how into this picture you drew of Carwin that you were, he's like, every time we were together, I carefully watched both you and Carwin. I studied your facial expressions. I studied your words, everything. And he does admit that he's like, you know, honestly, I didn't see anything from Carwin that he was in love with you. Like, he didn't do anything. He did admit it publicly, nothing kind of showed, so I think he's a little confused, um, which maybe makes him think worse of Clara, because mm. if she's not getting any signals from Carwin and he's not returning it, then she is pursuing this guy. Fully unrequited. Exactly. Uh, so then he says, you know, one night I came over to your place and Judith let me in, you were upstairs writing, and... Again, this is where I, I keep scratching my head with this stuff, right? Like, we're talking about these social mores and, and the, the mm -hmm. you know, he's acquiring a, a imp impropriety. He just busts into her room unannounced. like Sneakily, quietly. Right. Like, is he trying to, I don't know, anyway. <laughs> I don't know what he's, he's doing. He's reading over her shoulder. Right. And he sees her papers, and she quickly tries to hide what she's writing. Because it's about and... him, Right. Well, he's, all, I think all he sees is Summer House and Midnight. But he, we like, saw the scene words. of her writing earlier, did we not? We saw her at her desk writing about right. this, and she was writing about Playel, I thought. Mm, like, I we don't, don't know remember. he's there in that scene. Uh, yeah. But we true. see her writing. Okay. True, true, true. Uh, but anyway, he sees the words Summer House and Midnight, and he links it to Carwin. And thinks, like, oh, is she writing about something that she's already done? Is this something she's planning to do? Uh, you know, he's he's confused. And the fact that she doesn't... I guess this kind of does make sense, right? Because if... Remember how correspondence and letters are like... A thing every... Like, you got a letter and everybody read it. Like, you passed it around. Like, that yeah. was like the yeah, entertainment, right? Yeah, like a right? reading of the letters. Right, right. right. We've met, read many books where that's Right, the case. exactly. Yeah, that's what they did. They, they sat around and read their letters to each other. And we even had that. That was... Um, Whelan's first voice is they got that letter and had left it up in the temple and he went back to get it. Right. And he heard the voice saying, don't go up. Well, the fact that she then ha she was writing something, was writing a letter and then does not share it with him, does not make reference to it. That makes him suspicious. Like, why would you hide a letter you're writing from me? Right. And she blushes and she's like, oh, right. Exactly. Because it's about him. So she start he starts to feel a little suspicious uh but he he puts on a brave face he tries to think the best of of clara and carwin because he says you know i i know clara's character she's a wonderful person and this carwin dude like he's gotten no um signals so anyway right and he uh, thinks so highly of clara well, she is the best of women yes that if she actually does like carwin then Carwin must be fine. Like Right. Yeah. And and yeah, she maybe he is was wrong. She's the most like I think he said she was like the most sound of women and intelligent and clever and all of these wonderful things. And so if she's sure. making this decision to be or to pursue Carwin, then it must be a good choice. And he doesn't go as far as to give his blessing, but he says, Well, I'll back off right. to himself. He says that. Right. So that kind of is the extent of 13, and we flow yeah. into 14 um, to continue. Um, so he then, now we go into what happened basically yesterday-ish in the book. So what we mm. just talked about earlier of him uh, not showing up to their little group read. And so now he you know, tells her that the reason he didn't come to the reading is that um, he stopped at Mrs. Baton's, as you do, on your way right. over to somewhere, right? And he saw a newspaper sitting there, and he read it, and it talked about a criminal who had just escaped from, was it Ireland or Scotland? It was somewhere in, in England. Ireland. Mm -hmm. uh, a, a criminal who escaped prison, Newgate whose name was- Prison in Dublin. Yes, there you go. Uh, Francis Carwin. 
the escaped <gasps> prison. Dun, dun, dun. And the description of his features, his complexion, and his gait matched the Carwin that they know. Not to mention his name. I mean, right. I don't know how common the name Carwin is. I've right. literally never heard it except in this book, so. <laughs> yes, and I think if you Google it, I think this book the only thing that comes up. Um, well, or the other book, Carwin, the the unfinished book that Brock Carwin Brown the bi- Biloquist? The Biloquist, yes. <laughs> Which, I guess, spoiler, if you look up what Biloquist even means. Did then you look you've ruined Biloquist the book. Means? It, it means would possibly Two voices. Book. Yeah, like a ventriloquist, but you're yeah. a biloquist. Anyway, so we'll see how that plays into this one. Uh, I just thought it was interesting that, it, you know, his gait, like... Oh, you walk like this newspaper description. How accurate is this? Like, what does that even mean? Like, how Every do you describe? Every third step, there is a click of the right. hip. If you listen carefully, <laughs> the, the only thing I could think of was like uh, the Monty Python Ministry of Silly Walks skit. You know, like, oh, he does this, this, and then, and then this. You know, <laughs> and, 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 and you know, John Cleese going, oh, that's not a silly walk at all. Like, no, you have to do this. No, no, I have another one. Let me try this one. You know. <laughs> So, yeah, his gait matched the description. It's like, come on, man. It's all right. Okay. Newspapers used to be much more detailed. Uh, Apparently so. But this Francis Carwin, who escaped from prison, uh, he's a murderer and a thief. He has Mm. murdered, um, what's her name? The lady something, I forget. He murdered a woman, and he has (laughs) robbed Mr. Ludlow. Uh. So Carwin's like, okay, or Carwin. Uh, Playel is like, hey, I gotta look into this. So he goes to the publisher of the paper, and he says, hey, where did you get this info from? And the publisher says, oh, I got this. Is This article came from uh, from Mr. Hallett. Mm-hmm. So you're gonna have to go talk to him. So, of course, Playel says, okay, I'm gonna go talk to Mr. Hallett. And Hallett was a guy who was friends with Ludlow, and he got the information from him. So look Ludlow, at that. Yeah. Kids, so Lud- let this be a lesson in searching for primary sources. Yes, there you go. <laughs> And actually confirming where your information comes from. Exactly. Not uh, so just... Ludlow has spent had spent some time in the U.S. and had stayed uh, stayed a while with Mr. Hallett. They were friends, and uh, so he wrote a letter to to Hallett and was like, "Hey, this is what happened, man." And so Hallett got it printed uh, so that they could possibly find Carwin because in the letter um, it says that uh, he has escaped to America. So mm-hmm. He's going to America, and the timing of the escape kind of lines up with when Carwin showed up in Philly and comes into our story. So, um, I thought it was interesting. I, this is a little side note. I looked up, I thought the way they describe Mr. Hallett sounds like he's somebody, right? So I, so I was like, all right, let me see if this is, if this is a person. Uh, so they're actually, he actually was a person. This is, so we're, we're name checking like famous people in this book. Not like a general Mr. Hallett, but there was like the Mr. Yes, Hallett. Yes, there was, there was Stephen Hallett, who was an architect. Um, he was a Philadelphia architect. Oh. And apparently he, uh, when George Washington had his, you know, because the original, you know, George Washington was never in the White House. And Washington, D.C. was not the capital. Washington resided in Philly uh, and apparently had a house there. Uh, Hallett uh, met with Washington in Philly to discuss plans for the Capitol building. And apparently there was like a competition or I guess a bid sure. bidding war uh, for the Capitol design. And Hallett came in second. So his design uh, was not selected. Boo. But the guy who was selected um, had no construction experience, I guess, or no like. <laughs> Didn't know how to didn't know how to run a job site. You know, he just he drew like, a cool picture. It was like right. this should be the house. <laughs> <laughs> he was right. Well, he was an architect, not a construction engineer, ah, basically. Ah, ah. Right. Okay. So Hallett was selected since he came in second to like oversee the construction of the Capitol building. You know, the one that he didn't win, but he wanted to. Correct. But now you have to make the thing that you didn't. Correct. Like, get well. It. Uh, as the foreman on the job site, Hallett begins to change the design. Because I think no one could have seen that coming. Exactly. <laughs> so he gets fired from overseeing the construction of the Capitol. Uh, so he was he was replaced. He tried to change the winning design, I guess, to be more in line with, with what he liked. Uh, but he was actually, he was a Frenchman. He was born in France. And um, 
I did is not his write name down Mr. his. Mr. Halle, then. Well, yeah, probably. Well, well, he changed. I guess he changed his name to Stephen Hallett. Um, he had a different. <laughs> it's very a different American. Thing. Very American. It's very American. He had a French name uh, that I forgot to write down, but uh, but yeah. Anyway, I'll put I'll put a little link to the um, description in the show notes. So you can you can read up a little bit on Stephen Hallett. So I, this is kind of like uh, I don't know, like we're reading a book about whatever and. Um, you know, we like name we, drop right in the middle yeah, of your contemporary well, exactly. fiction. Like something, like, yeah. Like, and we went to Diddy's white party, and and you know, <laughs> two hundred years they're gonna be like, exactly, Diddy exactly. was a person who had exactly. these parties. <laughs> <laughs> he was a music producer and a rapper. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So uh... anyway, so so yeah, it's a little cool. brush with fame. Um, I'm assuming it's Mr. Hallett. I mean, it's not a very common name. Uh, it's the only. Only not, you know, I looked up Mr. Hall at Philadelphia and tried to see what I could find. And, and this is kind of what come up, you know, so it came up. That's awesome. Yeah, this is kind of cool. A little history lesson in here with this book, which is why we're reading it. Or one of the reasons why we're reading it. <laughs> so anyway, so he continues his story. Uh, so after he got the confirmation from, from Mr. Hallett about Mr. Ludlow's story and he's confirmed that, yeah, okay, the timing works out. It's probably Carwin. He's like, okay, I gotta, I gotta go talk to Clara. So she's in love with this guy. She needs to know that he's a murderer mm-hmm. and, a, and a villain. <laughs> well, as he's getting close to, to Clara's place, he hears voices. And it's mm-hmm. Clara's voice. And so he kind of sneaks up, you know, through the bushes or whatever and is listening. And, and he hears them. And they're talking about love. And they're talking about things they've done in the past, which he will not repeat in the presence of good company. So she's going into some detail, I guess. Which and she won't repeat in the presence, or he won't repeat. And he, I don't think, did he, did he say it? And she said to us, she's not going to repeat them. I can't remember. Let's see. One of them didn't said that they weren't going to say it. it. It might be he said it to her and she was like, I'm not going to repeat it to you, dear reader. It, it <laughs> I was going to say, because he should be able to tell her if he thinks she said it. Well, this is true. Very yeah. true. Instead of just saying, I won't say it. Yeah, it's probably right. But, probably but he says no. Well, I think he says no. It is impossible to repeat your avowals of love, your appeals See, to you former go. confessions of your tenderness, to former deeds of dishonor. There's two circumstances of the first interview that took place between you. It was on that night when I traced you to his recess. Thither. I like the word thither. Thither had he <laughs> enticed you. <laughs> and there you had ratified an unhallowed compact by admitting him. Great God, that's great. That's a great, yeah. like, it like ends in the great God. Thou witnessed just the agonies that tore my bosom at the moment. I think that's Clara, but like my voice Probably, is just a little yeah. bit too deep. <laughs> yeah, it's a little, little deeper, Clara. Uh, she's mad. Yeah, she's mad. I don't, I don't blame her. She's like, I mean, he's, he's going into some detail about what uh, she yeah. was saying they were doing. So, um, but then, so then he says, I, uh, I'm still going on my journey. Stay here if you want. And she's like, yeah, I'm not going to stay in your house, buddy. And she leaves. Yeah. And that is the end of our section. Whew. Intense. What bothered me about this section, though, is all the silences of Clara, where she's like, I I just decided that I shouldn't say anything. I shouldn't do anything. I shouldn't mm. say anything because it wouldn't have helped anyway. And I feel like <clears throat> in in fiction and plays and movies contemporary and not not that it's a cop out because I do believe that that surely does happen people decide to keep their mouth shut or they shouldn't say something but I feel like so many not I feel like I know so many issues could be solved and there would be no more dramatic (laughs) scenes if people just actually talked about what they were thinking or doing and when I see something where the characters do talk about it. Like, I know you haven't watched Ozark. No. We, that was like one of our, (laughs) that was one of our binges during lockdown. And that one was refreshing because I thought it was going to go down the route of, you know, husband, father doing something illegal, keeping it from his family and hiding all the secrets. And, you know, that's where the drama comes in. Mm-hmm. but it's not like he he's like i'm doing this and they're like okay let's keep doing it and like the whole family is involved in the 
illegal activity. They don't really want to be, but they kind of are. But mm. the fact that there wasn't this weird hiding and lying, I was like, oh, thank God. A little refreshing. Oh, this is much more interesting <laughs> now that everyone's involved in this thing. Anyway, um, but she's so silent all the time. Yeah, she just assumes that nothing she's going to say is going to change his mind. He's so convinced, so she doesn't even bother. Which might be true. I mean, probably so. He's, he's she has set. learned the cultural norms of her time, and she knows the society she's dealing with, and perhaps pleading her case will do nothing. Right? Yeah. We saw the um. So Mary Shelley's father was a big influence on this author. Charles Bachton uh, Brown. Okay. okay. And so we saw in Mary Shelley's Frankenstein a little hint of the justice system, which right. was extremely unfair, and she was writing about it on purpose, and people were accused of things without fair trial, and we saw poor Justine get put to death and <laughs> right. all of that, and she did nothing. Anyway, uh yeah, I don't I don't think speaking out versus silence was ever rewarded necessarily in, in this time frame. Still, cop out authors. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, we, I think probably what you have is a uh, male author writing female character. And so well, I think do a little that, bit for of sure. that. Well, yeah, well, I right. But I think it's it's, you know, as opposed to. Mary Shelley, you know, I think her, she injected a little, you know, we talked about it during that, but progressive-ishness into her story. Yeah, totally. I think as so. As opposed to, yeah, as opposed to, like, this is definitely more, you know, even though he's writing Clara as his heroine, um, she's not taking it to the man. I mean, she's not standing yeah. up to, I mean, she, she, I mean, she goes to, to play L. She tries to plead her case, but um, her case is pled in such a way that it fits society, right? Because yeah. she just says, well, you know my character. I would not do this. And that's her main argument as opposed to like, no, your evidence is, is terrible. And you you know that our family has these weird voice things going on. You've heard them yourself you've been a part of this anyway we've had uh, this exact conversation where someone has heard something that didn't make any sense right like and you know car was a weird sister. shady dude you knew him in spain and thought he was a weird shady dude and he has told us nothing about him like and now you think he's a murderer and a thief and yet you think i am the one at fault here <laughs> it's so funny because the things that they do have evidence for Clara's character and her behavior right. are the things that they brush aside and they do not believe. The things that they don't have evidence for, or or I guess he has evidence, but he can't explain it. He's like, if this is right. your character and the things I know you do and don't do, then how do you explain that I think that I heard you? I didn't see you, but I'm pretty sure it was your voice. Yeah. Those two things are don't match up, and so I choose to believe the awful one versus right. the one that makes the most sense over decades or however long they've known each other. Well, I, I don't mean, think the, they're even decades old. They might be like in their 20s. No. Yeah, they're probably in their 20s. But I, I think the whole painting a picture of Carwin and then staring at it for hours and showing it to everybody, <laughs> and you know, I think that, that sort of set him off. He's like, that's weird. Like, you don't normally do that. That's not something you right. would expect from Clara, I think. Well, but what if... We don't know what Carwin looks like. What if he looks like Pedro Pascal? And then, <laughs> therefore, it would make total sense that you would just gaze and in wonderment and like, how? <laughs> but if he still had his helmet on, she wouldn't know what he looked like. So it wouldn't matter. This is true, but this is before the bathing. Uh, in okay. he's not he's still not redeemed yet <laughs> he's still he's redeemed. Still or perhaps it's just a different show let's just say it's last <laughs> of us <laughs> he, he's, he can't be in other shows that's, that's not he's right in shows. he's in many other shows I last of us which shows. is excellent narcos which i gave up on after the first season but i'm sure it's still good 
And that was years ago. And then The Mandalorian. He which... was in an episode of Buffy the Vampire Slayer years and years ago. Was apparently. he now? Did you see? Yes. Sarah Michelle Gellar, post, she posted a picture of the two of them together uh, in a scene. The more I see of this man, something. the more of a delight he is in my life. <laughs> <laughs> he just seems like a you lovely the, human. Um, oh, no, let's uh, think of something else. Uh, anyway. <laughs> Speaking of delightful humans, have you seen uh, the supercut of Diego Luna talking about uh, Jabba's skin? No, but I like Diego the, Luna. Oh, yeah, I do too. The, there's a, a great video of him a- across multiple interviews across a long time span talking about <laughs> Jabba the Hutt's skin and how bad he wants to touch it. <laughs> it's, it's fantastic. They're like, they're like, Star Wars, just let the man touch Jabba's skin, please. I love... Touch. Diego Luma, Luna was in Itu Mama Tambien, and when I was in college, it was one of the movies that was like, I just watched it to watch it, but it was one of the movies that was like, for Spanish class, it was like, or you could watch this movie and write a short little like summary and report on it in Spanish, and it was like one of the popular among the Spanish majors and minors movies, and Diego Luna's in there with... Uh, Gael Gabriel wait Gael Garcia I always get Gabriel Garcia Marquez one of my favorite <laughs> authors and it's a Gael author Garcia he did oh he died in March of like this is his anniversary uh, <laughs> Gael Garcia Bernal this is Gabriel Garcia Marquez <laughs> anyway those two those two actors I love and then add Pedro Pasca oh <laughs> it's just great it's now we become great. a movie podcast because Wheeland is a slow moving book and we took <laughs> five chapters to, 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 to detail a conversation <laughs> that could have been it's, a single conversation it's an intense book though if you're like so this weird spiritual guy just spontaneously combusts and he leaves his kids behind then this guy shows up who's a biloquist but you don't know that yet we don't know that yet. And then all this crazy stuff happens. But in this kind of literature, it takes so long to get there. I feel like biloquist is a very specific skill. Like he can... Oh, yeah. Can he do more than just two voices? Because that seems very limited. I mean, it seems like he can. I mean, in the narrative, he can. He's Unless, they, unless the brothers and husbands and love interests can't possibly tell the difference between Clara and... And Catherine's voices. I mean, you couldn't, so it's possible. <laughs> I can't hear them. Unless he's just like, oh, my lady. He's just yeah. doing like your lady voice when you do oh, no. readings. <laughs> That's how bad it is. All right. Oh, I can't move too much. It goes my green screen. All right. <laughs> all right. Uh, all right. So any uh, other thoughts on this section? Um Clara just... is now a shamed woman, a stained woman, and Plael's getting out of true. Dodge. Well, it's according to society, she is now, and, and Plael's getting out of there. Okay, so it is the ability to speak in two different voices. A Maybe simultaneously? I don't know. Did you see... It seems very a... limited. Like, do you, do you get to pick which two you can speak in? I mean... Does he just do a girl and a boy voice? I mean, maybe it's like he hears one and it replaces the other. I don't know. It's... I don't know. That's what I, I have heard, like, some, like, exorcism stuff and how people debunk, like, the fact that people get, uh, that, that they can just speak in multiple voices. And so they're like, oh, that's a totally normal skill that people have. So that person is not possessed by a demon. Right. It, yeah. <laughs> so, like, if I speak in a British accent, does that mean I'm now a... British that's not a different voice that's just an accent oh it's an accent okay i have to do a different voice completely okay yeah there's a great like little tiktok that's been going around where the guy's like he's got a puppet and he's like this is my first day learning ventriloquism <laughs> and then he's like this is my second day learning ventriloquism and then the next one he's like this is my and then he cha- he's clearly a skilled yeah. ventriloquist he changes his right. voice and he's like that's not my voice <laughs> <laughs> And he's like, oh God. And it goes through now each day where the puppet is taken over. It's, oh, man. It's good. I feel like that's Carwin incarnate. Yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> All right. No, this Wild. is a good okay. section. It's about to get yes. better, I think. We think. 
some action. Speaking of, happen. our next section is going to be up through chapter 20. So if you're reading along at home, uh, read up through chapter 20. And how many chapters do we have? We're getting there. I don't know. We're about halfway through, maybe? I'm not sure. Let me 25, 6, 7. There's 27, 27 chapters. 27. So we've got, we've got three more episodes. Us like a full year and to do this. <laughs> no, we started this back in like November. It's only about six months. That's true. We were like, ooh, Halloween book. <laughs> I've had, yeah, seriously. I've I've had two two stage plays and a dinner show uh, in between here now. So I and am, regular life stuff and regular life stuff. Uh, you know, COVID and <laughs> other things that have uh, you know kept us down a little bit. Your play was a delight, by the way. Well, thank you. For I, all of our I viewers. quite enjoyed it. I had quite he's covering up his new hair, time. but he's dyed his hair. Yeah, I, and, uh, yes, I got his part cut in so that he can be a. Quite, how old are you supposed young, to be? With darker hair. How old are you supposed to be in the play? What's that? Your character. How, old in the play? how old's Tony? Uh, he's, he's probably like twenty-five. All right. Because he's out of college, he traveled for a bit, and then he went to Cambridge for a year, so he's twenty-five, twenty-six-ish. Okay. I don't know somewhere in there all right fair enough i think you could pass yeah. for 25 or 26 on stage i think in the makeup so. i think so with the hair yeah. tie and the cut I, mean, I certainly i certainly hope so it's a good thing you're not like a mid 40s somebody who like let themselves go or something like right that i can actually advantage. sure i can actually pretend to play that um you can like do a push-up or two yeah exactly it's fine <laughs> <laughs> well, somebody anyway um <laughs> But yeah, so it's it's been fun. I've uh, gotten into acting a little bit, and um, I don't know. We'll see where it goes. I'm enjoying it anyway. When my kids aren't so needy, when I don't have a two-year-old, I yes. think it would be something I would enjoy as well. Yeah. It's, I feel like it's a little easier when your kids are self-sufficient. They can get themselves a juice box. Yes. Yes. Brush their or teeth like without. over Christmas, I took two of them with me, and they were in the show with me. So it's... Well, that's how it started, right? They, they, they yeah, wanted they got, to yeah, be they, in it. They drugged me into it, yeah. And now you're the one in it. And now I'm the one in it. And now I've done, you know, before it was like, oh, okay, I did a little, I did some community theater or whatever. Uh, but now that I've done my third show and I had a fairly sizable part in this one, um, I feel like I could say I'm an actor. Can you? I Can think you? so. I think I'm legitimate now. <laughs> I only Do think you're agree? legitimate if someone pays you. Oh, well, that's, I got dinner at the dinner theater. Does that count? Oh, it's compensation. No, it doesn't. It doesn't, it doesn't count. count. Caterers also get dinner uh. when they, and they get paid. <laughs> and they're, and they're get, oh, and they're going to All right. Uh, no, I anyways. Think you can say that. I think you, if writers can say they're writers and sure. all they do is journal and write poetry, me, in their personal book go. and they're still a writer, for sure. Yeah. I, th- I think, I mean, I think as long as you act, you can say you're an actor, but I didn't feel... Until this point, I didn't feel legitimate in saying it, but now I feel justified. So I think I can say, I am an actor. I nice. act. Do you remember that one of your early roles as the guy with the hay fever in the Christmas play where oh. you sneeze a lot? <laughs> <laughs> Do you ever like try to channel? Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I remember that people, but you know, people said I did a great job after they that did. one too, when I was what, 10 or 12 or something. I don't you know, had to have been older there. than that. You think? I don't, I don't know. You were like the oldest one on stage. That's for sure. Was I? In the oh. kids' Christmas play. I mean, people told me I did a great job too, but... I was also like a shepherd during like VBS in the summer. Did that a couple times. See, you've had a tons so, of experience I, exactly. over a long I should, career. I should put that on my resume. <laughs> I carried the hay when I was 15 or something. I don't know. Who knows how old I was. I don't recall. I'm sure mom. Mom, if you're listening, how old was I? So right, we'll get a go. text in She'll like four or five days. We'll get a text in like ten minutes, right? Yeah, exactly. uh, yeah. If we were screaming this. Uh, okay. Anyway. Anyway, we're, we're totally losing the thread here on Carwin. Uh, so yeah. So this has uh, been classics you slept through. Hey, if you enjoy what we're doing, uh, tell and somebody why about wouldn't us. You? Yeah. I I'm certainly enjoying it, and we've been doing it for <laughs> almost three years. Holy. If you can believe that. I can't. I just Isn't got... it still 2020? Isn't it? <laughs> Isn't I hope it? not. Oh, Lord, I hope not. Uh, I just got a notification that our Twitter account turned three, and it's probably going to, I'm going to have to do some uh, infanticide on our Twitter account. Or infanticide? Uh, yeah, or toddler side. Infanticide? Because it's only three side. toddlers. 
toddler oh, aside. We're, we're gonna. Dumb. I know. I know. <laughs> Tw- Twitter is quickly getting worse and worse by the day, so we will find a replacement uh, for Twitter. I suppose I will have to start a Mastodon account or something, <sighs> whatever the new one is, uh, until the old Twitter employees that got fired uh, start up there. Right. New Twitter startup. Although, you know, half the source code was just posted online the other week, so maybe everybody's going to have a Twitter clone soon. Uh, anyway, so if you like what we're doing, you know, tell somebody about us. Um, like and review us on Apple Podcasts, if you please. Give us a nice review and a nice little rating. If you are listening to us on Spotify, you can hit us up with a uh, star rating on Spotify. And check out below the episode, there are questions of the week on Spotify. You can answer some questions and tell us what you're thinking of this book and different things. There is a quiz. Yeah, exactly. No. Uh, you can also follow us on social media. We are at CYST pod on currently Twitter until otherwise, uh, Facebook and Instagram. Social media also- is hard folks. Yes, it is it's hard. We are, we are also at CYST pod on YouTube now that YouTube has gone to handles. So you can just go to mm-hmm. youtube.com slash at CYST pod. And there we are. So like, and subscribe on YouTube. We are closing in on the magic 250. Probably by the time this comes out, we'll be at yeah. 250 Thank on you. YouTube. So then it's the road to a thousand, right? We'll do something. Sweet. We'll think of something uh, at a thousand subs on YouTube. We'll do something fun. Um, we'll think of something. I don't know, but Road to a thousand on uh, on YouTube. Like better. Uh, you can also hit us up on email, cystpod at gmail dot com. Uh, send us your thoughts. Tell us how you're liking the book. What's going on? We'll read some emails on the air. And uh, anything else this episode, Mayor? Oh. I want to know if anyone knows anyone who has spontaneously combusted. Oh. Or okay. That will be our or... Spotify question of the week. So if you're listening on Spotify. <laughs> Go over and we'll, uh, do you know someone who is spontaneous combustion? Or if you know someone or are someone who can speak in multiple voices, Ooh. send us a recording. There you go. That'll be like weird that. and cool. It would, definitely. Anyway. All right, so until next time, uh, you have until Friday. I need 500 words on what you did for spring break on my desk, please. Mm. Peace.